Well, thank you um, so much, Greg. I think what we'll do is hold all the questions for completion of the panel and then have an integrated dialogue. And part of the reason for that is because the panel itself is really encapsulating really the theme of this whole session by uh, really looking at how progress has been made, where some of the new opportunities are, um, what the complications are and what we've learned about those, how we can better integrate the combination of quality care and how it is experienced um, by um, those who are at the receiving end. So uh, with that, we'll now move to what has turned out to be uh, a really important chapter in the story on pediatric cancer, which is the complications that have occurred. And uh, Smitty Abatia is uh, really the leader uh, in this area who's contributed an enormous amount of information, first on the West Coast, but now moving to the East, you know, at least now in her new role in a major leadership at the University of Alabama. So. Thank you, Dr. Pizzo, for very, those very kind words. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the planning committee for inviting me. Um, my charge today, um, the, what Dr. Pizzo asked me to do was to lay out the current landscape in terms of long-term complications on the health and well-being of childhood cancer survivors. Um, I will start again by saying that we've made important and impressive strides in uh, terms of long-term survival, 20% um, improvement since 1975. We haven't even gone into the 1960s um, that Dr. Pizzo was mentioning. Um, there will be 500,000 childhood cancer survivors by 2020, one in 530 individuals between 20 and 39 years of age is a childhood cancer survivor. So we don't have to go too far before uh, brushing up against a childhood cancer survivor. Currently, there are over 350,000 childhood cancer survivors, and when we look at uh, who are those childhood cancer survivors, uh, half of them, 50% of them, are acute lymphoblastic leukemia, brain tumors, and Hodgkin lymphoma survivors. Another quarter uh, are constituted by soft tissue sarcomas, worms, and non-Hodgkin lymphomas, and then there are smaller populations of other primary diagnoses. Um, when we look at what their current age is, it's important to note that in pediatric speak, our childhood cancer survivors are aging. So anybody who's older than 20 years is aging, right? Um, <laughs> um, Dr. Piso alluded again to landmarks um, in pediatric oncology. I'm one of the aging people, too. Um, landmarks in pediatric oncology. In the 1970s, we really recognized that cure was po possible, and there was a proliferation of clinical trials. We threw the kitchen sink at our children. In 1980s, we tailored therapy uh, to risk factors. We identified late effects, or started identifying late effects, and started reducing radiation dose just because radiation was identified as a major culprit at that time. And substituting effective drugs for radiation. In the 1990s, we started understanding the relationship between dose and late effects. And then we started initiating efforts to track and educate our survivors. And that was the beginning of those large-sized cohorts and even medium-sized cohorts. So childhood cancer survivor study, one of the big cohorts, um, came into being in the 1990s. Um, in 2000s, we started defining late effects from these cohorts, really defining with precision what the magnitude of, of risk was, understanding the dose-effect relationship, and then developing the infrastructure to understand the pathogenesis of these late effects. And then we come into the next decade, which is where we are right now. Uh, we are continuing to define late effects from these cohorts. We are continuing to understand the dose-effect relationships. But we are embarking upon developing a better understanding of the pathogenesis of those late effects developing risk prediction models, and then also developing targeted interventions to reduce those uh, risks. So the charge I was given today was to describe the current landscape of morbidity and premature mortality, understand the, understanding the pathogenesis of this morbidity, identifying childhood cancer survivors who are at the highest risk, developing targeted interventions to reduce morbidity, and then how we have optimized, how, can, how we can optimize the long-term health of our survivors by partnering with parents and patients. 
So I will start by describing the current landsp landscape of morbidity and premature mortality. And what I'm doing for each of these uh, mandates is that I will provide vignettes of examples of research that is currently existing in these populations. So when we describe the long-term sequelae in childhood cancer survivors, we're talking about issues related to growth and development. We're talking about impairment of vital organ function, fertility and reproduction, and second neoplasms, and then the impact of all of this on the quality of life of our cancer survivors. We're talking about steroid-induced osteonecrosis in a 16-year-old that results in hip replacements. We're talking about major musculoskeletal deformities resulting from radiation. We're talking about a large and flabby heart because of anthracycline therapy or significant air trapping in the lungs because of radiation to the lungs. We're talking about um, lung cancer from, from radiation or breast cancer from radiation or meningiomas or brain tumors, again from radiation, and then um, highly fatal therapy-related leukemias resulting from exposure to chemotherapeutic agents. In no other study, uh, barring this one, has this been so clearly demonstrated by, uh, from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study by Kevin Effinger, where he's shown um, that the burden of chronic health conditions in our childhood cancer survivors increases as the childhood cancer survivors move away from diagnosis. Most sobering of that, that is the fact that those who have life-threatening or fatal conditions, the incidence of those conditions approaches 40% by the time they are 30 years out from diagnosis. So the implications of cure are not trivial. In fact, the burden of morbidity in our survivors of childhood cancer is absolutely substantial. And what does this result in? It also results in, unfortunately, premature mortality in our survivors, where you look at the US female population compared to the childhood cancer survivor study population, you see that there is a gap between the two. The same is true for the US males and, and the childhood cancer survivor males. And um, there is a continuing um, increase in mortality um, as the time goes on from diagnosis. What's even more sobering is the fact that the causes of this mortality is changing the landscape. The relapse-related mortality is plateauing out, but the non-relapse-related mortality continues to increase. Um, and uh, this is uh, something that we need to watch out for and work on. And so that leads to the next part of the talk as to why are these complications happening? What is the pathogenesis of this morbidity? Um, we know that there are certain therapeutic exposures which predictably in the childhood cancer survivor population result in certain late effects. So anthracyclines and chest radiation and heart failure, the association is clearly established. Radiation, alkylating agents, topoisomerase 2 inhibitors, and second cancers. Steroids and radiation and osteonecrosis, radiation and stroke. We know these relationships very well in our childhood cancer survivor population. What we um, know thus far is that a therapeutic exposure occurs and an adverse outcome develops but there's a black box there as to who develops these outcomes and can we predict whether these outcomes will develop given a therapeutic exposure. And what we now have, I believe, the tools to understand that what is the internal dose for every patient, any patient, what is the biologically effective dose for that patient? Does it alter the structure or function of the organs in the system? Um, does it result in preclinical disease before the clinically overt disease develops? And this is where we can say that we can identify patients who are more susceptible to a particular outcome and hopefully dissolve that black box. So this is how we undertook this um, initiative, and I'll give you this example. We identified key adverse outcomes in childhood cancer survivors. We took second cancers, osteonecrosis, heart failure, and stroke. We identified childhood cancer survivors without these outcomes to serve as controls, and we banked DNA and RNA from these individuals in order to understand the pathogenesis of these late outcomes. So they, we had a case control approach. There were therapeutic summaries. There were self-reported questionnaires. Most of the patients gave blood for DNA and RNA. Occasionally, we got saliva. Um, we had this study opened at 129 institutions. There are over 5,000 samples banked on these patients. 
And I'll use anthracycline-related cardiomyopathy as an example of how um, we have approached this. So we know now that there is a very clear dose-dependent association between anthracycline dose and the risk of heart failure. Very clearly established for doses greater than 250 milligrams per meter squared. Um, we also know that there is significant inter-individual variability. So if you look at cases, you see, and each of these dots represents a case, you see that there's a fair number of cases that have developed heart failure at a dose which is much lower than 250 milligrams per meter squared. If you look at controls, and the line cuts through 250 milligrams again, there's a significant number of controls who've escaped heart failure at doses greater than 250 milligrams. So this is that inter-individual variability we need to identify the causes of. And we uh, undertook this to see how we could do this. Um, doxorubicin undergoes a two-electron reduction with a, an enzyme called carbonyl reductase to form an alcohol metabolite which is significantly more cardiotoxic than the parent drug. In fact, one of the alleles, the G allele of this carbonyl reductase, um, ha has a higher protein level than the A allele. And so when we looked at patients stratified in terms of their G allele versus the A allele, we find that there is a significant separation in terms of risk for any dose uh, from 0 to 250 milligrams per meter squared. We then said, Patients who have received high-dose anthracyclines are at a tenfold increased risk of developing heart failure. Those who have high-dose anthracyclines plus hypertension are at a 35-fold increased risk of developing heart failure. Those who have diabetes in addition to high-dose anthracyclines are at a 27-fold increased risk of developing heart failure. So there's clearly an interaction with conventionally described um, cardiovascular risk factors. So we used an array, a SNP array, established by the IT Matt Broad and Care, um, the IBC SNP array, and identified a particular SNP that actually had a significant relationship with anthracycline dose, such that those who carried the GG allele were not at increased risk for any dose of anthracyclines. Those who had a GA allele had a modest increase, but those who had the AA allele were at a significantly increased risk. Of, um, of this toxicity. Uh, so this was repl replicated successfully in an independent cohort, and, and then we also um, showed corresponding gene expression results in, um, in healthy hearts from those who were genotyped with the risk alleles. We then conducted a genome-wide association study, identified a SNP on a chromosome 18 in self-gene, and found that the AA allele in this case, not associated with an increased risk at any dose, GA allele with a mild increase, and the GG allele with a significantly um, increased risk of developing heart failure. And this particular protein is encoded by, um, a G, by the self 4 gene. It regulates the alternative splicing um, of, um, it's involved in pre-mRNA um, alternative splicing, and it's implicated in the developmentally regulated alternative splicing of a particular <coughs> cardiac troponin T, which is a myocardial injury biomarker. And when you have the coexistence of two uh, variants, the CTNT em embryonic form and an adult form, it results in a temporally split myofilament response to calcium such that there is decreased myocardial contractility. And uh, these abnormal CTNT split splicing variants have been found in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. And we showed that. We showed that those who had the high risk variant, the GG variant, there was a coexistence of the embryonic and the adult forms of um, the CTNT, thus um, implicating this particular gene in, in heart failure. So just to summarize this heart failure story, anthracyclines, when we give anthracyclines to our patients, there's a prescribed dose, but then there's an internal dose, undergoes an electronic, one electron reduction, um, resulting in um, the, the reduced product. Then this, this can result in an increased production of uh, ROS, can result in mitochondrial dysfunction, can result in myocyte apoptosis. The two electron reduction can result in direct myocyte apoptosis. And then there's malady 
maladaptive LV remodeling, and then there's asymptomatic, um, and then symptomatic heart failure. So we've shown the implications of carbonyl reductase. We've shown the implications of a particular gene called HAS3, or hyalur hyaluronic acid synthase 3 gene, which has an antioxidant activity. And then we've shown that the self 4 gene can result in two variants of a CTNT, or the car cardiac troponin T, and decreased myocardial contractility. And this I present only as an example of what needs to be done in all of the outcomes that we are reporting in our patients. Um, so let's talk about identifying childhood cancer survivors at the highest risk. Um, childhood cancer survivors study very recently published an article on individual prediction of heart failure among childhood cancer survivors. So we are dipping our toes into this field. We are showing, they showed that they could create risk scores based on sex, age at cancer diagnosis, anthracyclines, and chest radiation dose, where the area under the curve was about 0.74. There was a 74% probability that they could be able to predict a person who was going to develop heart failure based on these clinical parameters. Um, they validated this in two independent cohorts. And then they collapsed these risk scores to form distinct risk groups. And what they showed was that people who had the lowest risk group were at a 0.5% risk of developing heart failure, those who had a moderate, moderate risk group at a 2.4%, and then the highest risk group were at an 11.7% risk of developing heart failure. And this was only with the clinical parameters. We took this and we added genes. We added genetic susceptibility to the story, and we showed that the, if we looked at the genetic susceptibility of the SNPs alone, um, the AUC, or the area under the curve, was 0.67. If we took only the clinical parameters, it was 0.69. But if we combined the two together, it approached 80%. Um, we did the same thing for glioma patients, um, again using that key adverse event study, and showed that if you took only the baseline model, the AUC was only 0.57. In the clinic model, clinical model, it was 0.76. Genetic model alone, 0.80. But if you combine the two, it was 91%. And so we are really essentially coming to a point where we should be able to say for a certain group of patients that you are at this much risk of developing a brain tumor, a radiation-related brain tumor um, up front before at the time of diagnosis of their first cancer. And this again shows the same story. The first one was for non-Hispanic whites and the second one was for all, all races. Let's go on to talk about targeted interventions to reduce morbidity. Um, we and others have shown quite clearly that when you give radiation to young girls for an unrelated diagnosis, most commonly Hodgkin lymphoma, you're significantly increasing the risk of breast cancer. And this risk actually approaches that seen in BRCA1 mutation carriers. We've developed a phase two clinical trial to reduce the risk of radiation, or, or at least understand uh, the ability of that trial to reduce the risk of uh, radiation-related breast cancer. We're using low-dose tamoxifen versus placebo in order to do that. We um, have shown that girls, or girls and boys, all children with, um, who, are, who have acute lymphoblastic leukemia, those who are non-adherent to 6-MP have a higher risk of relapse as compared to those who are adherent to their therapy. We now have a comprehensive approach to improve medicine adherence in pediatric le uh, leukemia with the help of text messaging, directly supervised therapy, and education. Um, I'm sorry for the animation, um, but let's focus on the upper panel. We've shown that um, for girls who've received um, an unrelated autologous or related donor transplant, that there's a significant increase in risk of cervical cancer, tenfold or elevenfold amongst those who've received an unrelated donor transplant. And we're now looking at a quadrivalent human papillomavirus vaccine in cancer survivors. We're looking at the safety, the immunogenicity, and efficacy. Um, this is being led by Wendy Landier. 
And as I mentioned, we have um, shown that anthracyclines result in heart failure. Others have shown it very clearly. It's been known for a very long time. Um, but we're now embarking, and it's led by a trial by Dr. Armenian, at a phase two clinical trial to reduce the risk of anthracycline-related heart failure using carvedilol. So now the final topic, which is optimizing long-term health by partnering with parents and patients. Um, we know that there's a substantial burden of morbidity. We know that there are clearly defined genetic and therapeutic factors that increase the risk of long-term complications. We know that there is an extended and standardized need for follow-up for follow of these childhood cancer survivors. But we also know that the survivors and the healthcare providers need to be aware of those who are at risk for these complications. We also know from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study that about only 35% of our survivors are aware of the serious health problems from past treatment. And this impairs their ability to seek or receive appropriate long-term follow-up care. Those of us who have children in their 20s know that they will never go back. They'll never go to the doctor, even if their mothers set up the appointments for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we look at healthcare utilization, we find that most of our survivors are in medical contact. We know that they go and get general physical examinations, but very few come to the cancer center and very few get care in specialized centers. Um, so the primary care providers are primarily responsible, but they're unfamiliar with the problems faced by the childhood cancer survivors. And for this reason, the Children's Oncology Group had developed the long-term follow-up guidelines um, to standardize the care. So the first question that needs to be asked is what can clinicians, parents, and patients do to help attenuate the long-term complications? We need to increase the awareness of long-term complications amongst clinicians, and we need to provide them with tools for standardized cares, and hence the Children's Oncology Group long-term follow-up guidelines. With respect to the parents and patients, we need to educate them regarding long-term complications and health promotion. And here's where uh, we looked at this very carefully, and I know it's red and it's I'm borrowing just a little bit of time. Does, uh, does tailored education delivered in a survivorship clinic improve childhood cancer survivors' awareness of personal risk of therapy-related complications? So if you bring them to the clinic, do they get educated? And this was um, done in um, our City of Hope clinic, led by Wendy Landier, where we looked at survivors' awareness of their specific health risks, evaluated for nine therapy-related complications. And you can see these complications that we examined. And we uh, administered a questionnaire before the clinic visit, educated them, did the same thing again and again each year, once a year, for many years in a row. And these are the results that I'll show you. We found that indeed for all nine of them after three visits, there was an increased awareness of their personal health risks. Um, so you see that they did, did become aware. What's interesting to note is when you look at the longitudinal trajectory of knowledge gain, this is what happens. That in that first year, there's a significant increase in knowledge. In the second year, there is maintained increase in knowledge. Third year, again, there's an increase in knowledge, but after that, you peak out. And the increase in knowledge is only two-thirds of the patients demonstrate an increase in risk of knowledge, uh, increase in knowledge of their personal risk. Um, are we approaching survivorship in an evidence-based fashion? This was another question that Dr. Piso asked us to address. Um, We've described the health and well-being of our childhood cancer survivors. We've described the magnitude of risk of specific complications. We've described the association between exposures and specific outcomes. We've developed risk prediction models. At least we're dipping our toes into that water. We've, we're developing interventions for our patients. Um, we are describing the magnitude of risk of specific complications. So here we are, um, the risk of, of um, breast cancer in our Hodgkin lymphoma patients, um, showing a very clear dose-response relationship between um, the dose to the breast and uh, risk of, of uh, breast cancer. We are, when Dr. Riemann was the chair of the Children's Oncology Group, he mandated that we have all patients have a summary of their therapeutic exposures at the end of therapy. And from there on, all patients were followed for life using a long-term follow-up center um, with the long-term follow-up guidelines. 
that we've established. What we are now expo ex uh, exploring, looking at these consensus-based guidelines in trying to see whether we can look at the efficacy and the cost effectiveness of these guidelines. And um, in the interest of time, I won't go into the details of this, but we've shown that these are efficacious, that they are cost effective, for at least for the cardiac outcomes that we have. But we can also improve upon them using these Markov modeling techniques. Um, so I'll end this talk by saying that we expose our patients to therapeutic exposures. We haven't even gone into the world of the targeted therapies yet, but we know that they develop adverse outcomes. And there are significant modifiers that uh, uh, have an impact on this relationship. Our goal is to identify those who are at the highest risk, modify the treatment protocols if we can, screen those that we uh, are already exposed, and that, uh, then develop risk reduction um, in the high-risk groups using a very targeted approach so we can get rid of these adverse outcomes. And I'll end my talk here.